Okay, we'll be in Matthew chapter 5. We will start in verse 27 and we'll see how far we get. We might not even get to verse 1, uh, but we're going to take our time. Um, we're living in an age where marriage is being destroyed by the enemy. I don't know if you noticed that, but it definitely has been taking place recently. That hasn't changed. That has been the plan of the enemy from the very beginning. When God created man, Paul says that God created Adam first, and then he created woman. And woman was to come alongside the man and be his helpmate. The enemy didn't like that plan, so the enemy came and tempted her to usurp her authority over the man. And he caved in and gave in to her a request to eat of the fruit and thus sin entered into the world. Now he's responsible because God made him first and made him the head over the woman. And sin entered the world and what happened? God then had to kick them out of the garden and death entered into the world. And so from the very beginning we have seen an attack on marriage. So this isn't the beginning of his attacks upon marriage that is Satan. He's always been there to attack marriages. We've seen it uh, with uh, Abraham, who was married to Sarah, and God had made a promise to him that he would bring a seed through Sarah, his wife. Well, they couldn't wait, and so he had a relationship with his maidservant. And Paul tells us that that maidservant is representative of the law. It has brought humanity into bondage. Sarah represents the grace of God, and the women are to be, as Peter says, daughters of Sarah. And so it affects society. It, it affects the world, the relationship between a man and a woman when they allow someone to enter in that relationship, which is called adultery, which we'll speak about this morning. We've seen it throughout history. We've seen it with David and Bathsheba. And you know the story and how he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And not just adultery, but in the, in the preceding verses that we saw a couple of weeks ago, murder itself, the physical act of murder also. And so it's nothing new. It has been happening since the very beginning and it will continue to happen. Unfortunately, uh, our laws have changed. Now it is a... Uh, a constitutional right and also a civil matter as far as same-sex marriage. Uh, one pastor shared, he said, as a pastor in three different churches encompassing 28 years, I'm beginning to wonder if there is such a thing as an innocent party concerning marriage. And, and that's our topic today is defending marriage. Uh, his observation, and I would tend to agree with him because I have been pastoring now for, for about 21 years, and I have seen that in marriage, it takes two uh, to work through that marriage. Sometimes it will take one, and that one has to be very strong, uh, very close to the Lord, and is able to endure some of the hardships of that relationship. But yes, one can do it, but it takes two. And it's usually both that are at fault in that relationship. I have noticed that also, that we all have sin in our lives. We all have struggles that we deal with. We all have pride. And in relationships, it's important that you submit yourself or humble yourself to one another in that relationship in order for that relationship to survive. And so when you are in that relationship as a husband and wife, it's about fighting a battle. And it's a spiritual battle. And it's a battle that you have to take care of in your own heart as an individual, as a wife and as a husband. It is a battle that takes place in you first, where you understand that I have to fight for this marriage, and there will be battles, and the enemy will come against us. The flesh will be there. There will be hungers and desires by both parties for different things, not just outside relationships, but also just for power and control, too. And there will be times when one individual or both individuals will not speak to each other for weeks or for months. And that's okay. Don't give up. Even at those times, you have to continue to fight for that relationship. Not looking to divorce, not even thinking of divorce, but looking for God's healing and power to heal that relationship. And he can. And it may take one year, two years, ten years, but he can still do it once the individuals come to an end of themselves when they surrender themselves totally to the Lord and surrender themselves to one another. And then that relationship will grow. I have seen that. 
I have seen that and experienced that in my own relationship. And so I agree with this pastor. We are dealing with marriage issues before more than ever before. Friday, as you heard, the United States Supreme Court has made a ruling over the Obergefell versus Hodges in this case about same-sex marriage, and it passed. And we are hearing all kinds of information from whether it's Fox News or CNN and others on how it will affect us as a society. And some are saying that it will, some are saying that it won't, that it won't affect us at all. How will it affect the churches and what kind of attacks can we see? Uh, We are hearing people talk about those issues that it won't affect churches because churches also have civil rights they have the first amendment religious of freedom and and so forth and so it really won't affect the churches it will affect our uh, businesses uh, like we have seen with um, small chapels who who cater to the world and in uh, putting on wedding ceremonies it will affect them if they decide not to host same-sex marriages it will affect uh, uh, pastry companies cake making companies that that make cakes and if they decide not to um, make a cake that that shows a man and a man or a woman and a woman on the cake you know so it does and may affect them even more today because now you're violating their civil rights in the UK there is a couple two males who wished to get married, they went to their church, and they denied them. This couple are millionaires, and so they have decided to sue the church. Because, and when I read the article, it's interesting how they fall on this issue of love. By the way, that's going to be the slogan for the next uh, several months, is love wins, love wins. It's all about the, the phileo erotic love uh, that they have for one another, and that love wins. This couple who wish to be married in the church, who wish to be married by a minister, who wish to put on a great event, are being denied their civil rights in the UK. And so they are suing the church. Um, If it's happening there, it can happen here also. That's the next step. And so churches are beginning to look at their bylaws. They're beginning to look at how they run the church. They're beginning to look at the applications of, of wedding ceremonies and so forth. Um, and and how we can approach that so that we can be fair about how we make the decisions to have weddings here in the church. Some churches are are making the choice to to totally deny any weddings whatsoever. We don't perform weddings, nor do we allow weddings in this church. And and so that's one way of getting around it. So um, those are things that the church has to look at. A friend of mine who's a lawyer, this is... He got the briefing and the decision on this whole uh, issue. And I just want to read to you what some of the uh, justices said. For instance, Justice Robert, joined by uh, Scalia and Thomas, warned of the potential loss of tax exemption status to religious organizations that oppose same-sex marriage. This is their written arguments and decision and what these judges, Supreme Court judges, wrote. And so... The implication there is is if this church opposes same-sex marriage, our 503 can be uh, revoked and we will no longer have the exemption. Justice Thomas, joined by uh, Scalia, said this decision will have potentially ruinous, ruinous, and I underline ruinous, these are his words, consequences for religious liberties. Justice Scalia, joined by Thomas, wrote, separately, to call attention to this court's threat to American uh, democracy. He further said that to allow the policy question of same-sex marriage to be considered and resolved by a select partisan, highly unrepresentative panel of nine is to violate a principle even more fundamental than no taxation without representation. No social transformation without representation. In other words, what he's saying there is that this decision is higher than anything else. And it will stand. The governor of Texas said it won't stand in Texas. And he made it a law that same-sex marriage is illegal. So the battle has started. Now, I know God has won the war, right? 
Go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19. God has won the war. We're in heaven. Victory is his, and it's over. We know that. And the battle's just beginning, though, for us here on this earth. And we need to stand up and stand our ground during these times. This is just one issue that is against destroying marriages in our country today. As I said earlier, some are saying that it's not a big deal and that it won't affect our country. Reading another article by a psychologist, and um, he basically said it will affect our children. Now, think about that for one second. How will it affect our children in the school system? They now have to, because it's, again, the the civil issue, they now have to study about homosexuality. They now have to go through the same-sex things, uh, same-sex classes and so forth. They're going to now be introduced to this stuff and shown how to do it. They're already doing it now, kind of stealthily, without unawareness but now they can openly do it to all the children and when you have a school as the young lady said on the video when you have a school that doesn't teach about God that doesn't teach about prayer that doesn't teach about morality what you're going to do is you're going to have a generation that will rise up and change the world and that's how Obama rose up that's how we have a lot of our leadership today that have risen up without God it will affect our children not just publicly but also morally and psychologically because now you'll have children that are in these relationships with same-sex parents who will have no idea what it is to have a father and a relationship with father but only with the female or have a female or have no understanding of what it is to be a female and only have a father uh, figure in a sense so there's a lot of implications there Um, what it will do to society we don't really know at this moment but we know Biblically, what it has done to society because God's judgment has always come upon uh, those that began to embrace homosexuality. And you can start all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah and shortly after God judged it. Uh, And it's still judged to this day where there's nothing that uh, lives in that area. So this is an attack on marriage itself and we need to defend marriage. One commentator said this, in this second contrast here that we'll be studying on adultery, it's a contrast on the commandment of adultery to expand to include indulgences and in illicit sexual activity in the realm of the imagination. Jesus is going to get to the heart of the matter. It's not just about defending marriage by keeping those outside from coming in and committing that act with another person, but it's also about protecting the heart of what the definition of marriage is so the challenge is given to go to the limit to eliminate this sin that's in our life adultery or whether it's fantasy or whether it's indulgence in illicit sexual activities and we have another attack on marriage and we see it today Uh, the divorce rate is over 50 percent more people get divorced than they ever get married More people are living together more than ever before. That's another attack and a lie of the enemy. And more people, and and this is what I find so interesting, which is so confusing today for society because they're not reading their Bibles, they're not studying God's word, and they're not finding out what God has to say about the issue, is that people think that God embraces it because someone tells them that God embraces it, and he doesn't. Nowhere in the Bible do you see God embracing that type of lifestyle. And, and not just homosexuality, uh, sensuality, fornication, and all of that. He doesn't embrace it. In fact, he lists it uh, in Galatians as a list of those that will be going to eternal damnation. And he's very clear if you practice those things. So those who live together and are in the churches and they're living with somebody, it's sin. And you need to get out of it. You're jeopardizing your salvation and your walk with the Lord. You're back under the law because you're not following the grace of God, unfortunately. And yet there are those that embrace it because, again, love, the definition of love. We need to define that word and what love truly means because love also means to warn. If my child sees me cooking on the stove and he comes up and says, Daddy, I want to put my fire in that hand. Oh, sweetheart, I love you so much. Oh, you just go ahead and do what you want because, you know, you're an individual, you're a person, and you understand that you have choices, and so if that's what you want to really do, then you just go ahead and do it. No, that's not true. A good father that loves a child will say, No, you don't do that because you will get burnt. And I love you enough to tell you no. I love you enough to 
slap your hand if you even get close to that fire that's what true love is that's true love and so it, love has its boundaries love has its um, areas that you just stay out of love is able to say hey I can heap coals upon you and it's the love of God that will cause men to repent because those, the, the coal of love is you know um, think about coal being dumped on you right a heap of coal go have a barbecue all those red hot coals throw it on someone you think they'd love you probably not they, they get on fire but love can do that if you love someone by saying no this is wrong it will hurt them of course it will hurt them but you're hoping that they'll come to a realization that it's wrong and you're right it's going to cause me more damage than than uh, help me whatsoever to live the way that i'm living and so jesus is is making a call to eliminate that sin and do whatever it takes to eliminate that sin he's going to talk about the eye and the hand and cutting them off now we have moved from murder the command of murder to the command of adultery those two commands we find in the te in the ten commandments there in exodus and deuteronomy chapter five right when the lord god told moses to write these commandments down and one of them was thou shall not murder another one is thou shall not commit adultery and these commandments are towards humanity towards uh, our brothers and sisters are not sins against God, but they're against man. And so committing murder is against your brother and sister if you commit murder. If you commit adultery, it's against your spouse. Just as with the command not to murder, Jesus is concerned with the inner state that leads to that action of murder and does not simply prohibit the outward deed. And so he's going to get to the matter of, of the issue. So he continues to expose our heart. Our heart. So as we go through these scriptures, again, God is exposing our hearts. And you may find yourself in sin as we go through this. And when you do, God has left us a way out. First John 1 John 1.9, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. And so we walk in forgiveness and we walk in confessing every day. So the theme today is defending marriage. Let's go ahead and, and read um, verses 27 through 30, if you will, with me to read the text this morning. Jesus, again, is speaking to uh, the disciples and those that are listening around him on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And we'll stop there and see how far we get. And so defending marriage, uh, we need to defend marriage. The f marriage is under attack. And the church needs to rise up and begin to be heard. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we vote when the opportunity shows itself. Make sure that you are registered and make sure that you have a voice. Not only that, you defend it by living it out in one another. You cannot defend it by being separate from one another. I really believe that God is clear in the Old Testament and in the New Testament when he says the two shall become one. Virginia is starting to look like me except the tan. <laughs> we become one, guys, not two. Too many marriages separate from each other. They don't take on their names. They take on their other names. They don't take on their financial responsibilities. They have each their own financial responsibilities. Uh, they separate the children from one another. Um, it becomes a, a matter of dividing and not uniting. When the Bible says, God says himself, you become 
one. And we'll see later on down the road, when we do get divorced, that's why you cause another man to commit adultery. Because you now are one with each other. And even if you are divorced, you're still one. And if you marry someone else, you have caused that person to commit adultery because now they become one in their relationship. This is serious stuff, guys. This is serious stuff. And we really need to make a choice on defending it personally. So Jesus is going to deal with adultery which is committed by being unfaithful to your spouse, the physical act. God has established marriage. He's established the marriage vows so that the family unit can be strong. God wants the family unit to be strong. There's a spiritual implication here by Paul that the family unit, the husband and wife, represents church and the Christ. We represent what Jesus did for the church. And as a husband and wife, we are light and salt to the world. And so when they see us, they should see Christ. And they should see Christ in us. And it should be so evident that they know that we are Christians by everything that we do. It creates a strong family unit. One of our um, themes here for the church is, is creating strong communities by strengthening one person at a time or strong families by strengthening one person at a time. And if you can strengthen an individual to have a relationship with Christ and then another individual and then come together, you have a strong family, a biblical family, a good Christian family that, that is un, unwavering, that no one can knock over. And as Jesus uses words, no one can put asunder or divide because of that relationship. If marriage or if a marriage is destroyed, the breakdown of the family unit would have uh, grieve consequences uh, for everyone. Uh, it was interesting um, <laughs> as you're reading a lot of posts, reading articles, so forth about this. Uh, this young lady who used to come to this church um, year about three years ago or so, and they moved back uh, east home. They came out here to resolve some issues, and they were coming here for a while. And, and by the way, the body here really ministered to them, and we have uh, stuck into their hearts, and we're deeply there, and they appreciate that, how much we poured into this young couple. She was pregnant at the time. Now they have a little girl. They're going to be visiting us here uh, soon, they said. But it was interesting because I was reading a paper on um, on this whole uh, same-sex thing, and, and this was a theologian who wrote this paper, and he was talking about how how it doesn't make any natural sense for same-sex marriage because there is no life that comes from it. If God would have created Adam and Steve, it would have ended there, right? Because there's no life that comes from that. They can't have children. And so anytime a society begins to embrace that, life begins to stop. And the more you embrace it, eventually that life is gone. And it's interesting that this young lady all of a sudden, uh, she posted and she says, you know, I was just thinking about this whole thing. And I just thought about Jesus and he came to give us life. You know, and, and if he came to give us life, how does same-sex marriage produce life? It doesn't produce life. And I was just blown away. I'm like, Here's a young lady who reads her word, and this is what the Holy Spirit was telling her. Here's a theologian who studied in Bible colleges and books and for degrees and all of this stuff, and he comes up, and the Lord gave her the same wisdom as he had. That's an awesome God. And so don't tell me that, that, that uneducated people are dumb or they don't know what they're doing. No, if they read the Bible and they know who God is, they are more wise than those in the world today. And that's what the Bible says. We have more wisdom than the wisest man in the world. And that's some wisdom for a young 20-year-old gal to see that and not have a, a degree in theology and so forth. There are grave consequences. Life itself is at, uh, at the noose in a sense. So not committing adultery is a command from the beginning. Moses had said this in Exodus chapter 20, thou shall not commit adultery. That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion, and yet we see it happen all of the time. We can protect ourselves from doing that. We really can, and we'll talk about that as we go through this message. We see King David who fell into that very act, and we see the procedure on how he fell into that adultery and how he was on the rooftop and how he visually saw, and this is what Jesus is dealing with, the visual aspect, the lusting, 
uh, the imagination. And so here's David imagining what it would be like to be with Bathsheba, seeing her bathe on the rooftop of her home. And so it begins in the imagination. It begins in the heart. And then when it starts there, the next step is obvious, and that is to the physical act itself. And that is exactly what happened to David. And of course, when Bathsheba was pregnant, and David could not hide it any longer, he then had her white husband killed within a battle and then embraced her as uh, his own. The consequence, they lost the child <clears throat> to death. It does affect us and it will affect you. Don't believe the lie that the enemy has put out there. Here's one of the lies and you've heard this said before. I'm not in love with him anymore. I'm not in love with her anymore. I love someone else. I love someone else. I don't love him anymore. That's a lie of the enemy. That is a lie of the enemy. No, love is not a feeling or emotion. You learn to love that individual. As I mentioned earlier, it may take months and you may be angry and not talk to each other, but as long as you keep seeking God and you keep seeking his grace and his mercy, he'll give you that love back again. There's a story that's been on the uh, internet long, uh, for a while. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I, uh, every time I read it, I just, I just weep in tears. And you probably have... have um, read it but it talks about a husband and a wife that were just struggling in their relationship and in their marriage and it talks about the husband having a woman on the side in the office jane and now he's going to tell his wife that um that he's going to leave her and divorce her and so she, he sits her down and he begins to tell her that i love someone else i no longer love you whatever has happened i've lost that love for you and so i'm going to seek for a divorce well they had a little boy and so the wife says okay i understand as calmly as she could without crying or or, or getting emotional she said i just ask one thing just give me one month just one month to show our little boy that that uh, that you are a good man, so he agreed. She says, "I want you just to carry me into the room like on our wedding day, every day, and every night, every night that we go to bed." So it's like a weird request, but all right, one month and we'll be done with this. And so, <clears throat> so the first night he picks her up, starts to carry her through the 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 doorway, just like on their wedding day, and, and puts her on the bed. And he thought, okay, so I got through that. Went home and went, went to work, I'm sorry, and then told Jane, yeah, we're going to get divorced and we'll be together soon. And then this went on the next day and the next day and the next day. And the boy all of a sudden saw and says, wow, it's so wonderful to see you guys in love with each other. I'm just so excited with what God has done and, you know, just, just really excited about the whole thing. And, and he noticed that every time he carried her through there, he would smell the perfume. He would smell her scent. They haven't gotten together that long uh, in a while. They weren't that close. And so he just started remembering things about what they used to do. And so then he did the act again. And then he realized that she, she seemed to be getting lighter and lighter as he carried her through and he thought well maybe my muscles are growing you know I'm now doing this on a regular basis and so forth and so by the the, the end of the month he changed his mind and so he went to work and he told Jane I, I can't divorce her I'm in love with my wife and so he comes home that night and as he enters into the room he sees his wife on the bed and there is a note and the note basically uh, says and I'm paraphrasing I don't remember exactly what it what it said but basically says that you have shown your son that you love him and I appreciate that and that you love me and um, I've had cancer and she died on the bed there and so she saved his character and reputation in front of his boy so that he would be looked at as a good husband and a good father as she passed away. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's the idea that Jesus is talking about, crucifying yourself. She could have easily said, I'm dying of cancer and you're doing this. What kind of evil, wicked person are you? But she didn't. She said, I'm going to make you look good before I die so that you can have a relationship with my son. <clears throat> that's what it takes to keep a marriage. But yet many men have fallen and we know that and let's be truthful you know not all of us have the perfect marriages in fact it's probably less perfect than what we make it out to be um, 
No one uh, is protected from their fleshly sins. No one. And so that's why it is a battle that we need to fight on a regular basis. Uh, We have seen even women commit adultery. uh, And it just seems to be rising more and more today um, than ever before because of what's going on in society. Our TV shows spread adulterous acts with friends, neighbors, and even same-sex affairs. Uh, that we see on TV, on the movies, and we go watch this stuff, and it's implanted into our children, it's implanted into us, and we don't love each other, and so the next obvious thing is, is we need to move out, we need to separate, we need to go our separate ways. And the world enjoys airing this stuff out, you know? uh, Hollywood is known for this. You know, they get married just because of publicity, and then divorce in a couple of years, and so forth. So I think Jesus would be totally shocked at the whole situation if he were to be here today and what's going on. So verses 27 through 30 talk about adultery which destroys marriages. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. This first part of this scripture, most of us can probably sit back and say, Yeah, I haven't committed adultery. I've never had a physical act with another individual you probably all say that and you're safe for saying that and for doing that congratulations because um the temptation definitely is there i had been witnessing at uh the riverside bus station one night with a bunch of guys we were witnessing to this young lady who was waiting for her bus and uh we ended up going inside the the bus station there sitting down and we ended up buying her a cup of coffee as we were sitting there and the temptation is always there from the opposite sex uh, because the enemy knows uh, how to destroy a Christian man. I remember we were sharing with her about Christ, the love of Christ and what he had done and so forth. And we're sitting at the table and all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, I feel something on my leg, like someone bumped it. And I thought, okay, so I kind of moved my leg a little closer to me. And then all of a sudden I feel a leg, like a foot rubbing up and down on my leg. And I'm thinking, all right. And so I kind of move back a little bit more. And then all of a sudden I feel her, a stretch with the leg rubbing. And what she was doing was distracting me. You know? And in my mind, I'm starting to thinking, what is going on here? And I jumped up. I says, no, that's not why we're here. Go, we're here to share with you Jesus Christ. You know, my friend's looking at me like, what, what, what just happened? You know, and I'm telling her, we're here to share Jesus Christ with you. You need Jesus. This is your problem. You know, this is not right. This is what's wrong. And so uh, we were able to share with her. But this is how the enemy works. He will put us in places or allow things to happen while we're in places to tempt us in situations, whether it's at work. A lot of times it's at work, right? You're fighting at home. You're not talking. So who are you talking to at work? Well, you're talking to so-and-so. And and -and so-and-so's listening. And -and so-and-so's nice. And -and so-and-so's telling you exactly what you want to hear. And eventually you start falling in love with so-and-so until you get married and you realize he's not so nice. He's just like the other guy or like the other girl too because we're all sinful and we have to realize that to protect ourselves from this act of adultery. <clears throat> little humor to break this up because I know it's pretty difficult um, to hear. A returning from Sunday school where the Ten Commandments had been the topic of the day, a young boy asked his father, Daddy, What does it mean when it says, thou shall not commit agriculture? And there wasn't hardly a beat between the question and the father's reply. Son, that just means that you should not suppose, that you're not supposed to plow in another man's field. (laughs) Funny, but true. You're not supposed to plow in another man's field. You have your own field. Plow in your own field. You know, God has created marriage. He created it for a man and a woman to have intimacy and to love one another. And that should be a cherished and precious thing that is done between the both of you. There's nothing wrong with that at all. To enjoy one another's company, uh, enjoy the fellowship and the intimacy, uh, the prayer that goes into it, you know, and then that just becoming that one with one another. Nothing wrong at all. Uh, You should enjoy it to the utmost uh, ability, but this isn't about that. And so you should protect that completely. Adultery in the Bible 
is defined sexual relationship between a married or betrothed woman and anyone other than her husband. In the Bible, adultery is punishable by death. Adultery was also a metaphor for unfaithfulness to God, which I want to talk about because I think it's just as important. So, unfaithfulness to your spouse, to your husband. In the Jewish culture, you could also get promised in a sense, uh, betrothed to someone. And in, in that time of being betrothed and promised to that individual, if you had relationships with someone else, that was considered adultery and you could be stoned to death also. So God considered faithfulness very highly. The Stoic philosopher Epitius, who was a Greek philosopher, also spoke against contemplating adultery in one's imagination. So this is something that they realize as, as a culture that the imagination will lead to the act. Philo counsels men and women to avoid seeing the naked bodies of those of other sex, since even against the will of individuals, this can lead to conceiving disgraceful actions. So even looking at a naked body will lead the imagination to stray away. So it's important to understand that even the culture realized this. Dr. Dobson was on a committee years ago that was looking at pornography. And so he studied it very deeply. Uh, he took a step of faith and trusted in the Lord. Uh, and he actually viewed a lot of this stuff. And, and, and to this day, he says it, it was just horrific in his mind and he detests it completely. Uh, but he sees how it affects our society and it affects individuals. In the ancient world, generally it was held that a married man could have sexual uh, adventures as long as they did not involve the married woman, which would mean violating the rights of her husband. So there were some liberties that the cultures took, and we see that today. <clears throat> a, a married man could have a mistress on the side as long as they weren't married. That was allowed. Now, a, a married woman could not have at all any, uh, what do you call a mistress? A mistress? You know, any kind of relationship uh, with another uh, individual she had to make sure that she was completely chaste in her relationship and faithful in that relationship we see that today we we call it uh, open marriages they call them open marriages you can be married to an individual committed to that individual for all kinds of reason openness uh, but it's open to having other relationships besides the one that you have because of uh, excitement, because of boredom, you know, those type of things. But you want to keep that relationship because you have children, you have financial responsibilities. So they just call it an open relationship. We see that today. That's sin. And it shouldn't be in the church. <clears throat> uh, swinging. Uh, there was a, a couple in another church that was sharing and they were highly involved in the, the swinging scenes uh, of same-sex uh, couples and and so forth and again it just destroys the command jesus cites uh, makes no distinction here though people of both sexes were to remain faithful specifically he speaks of the man as the adulterer here though as we'll see in in 32 but also in chapter 19 verse 9 um, so both parties have to stay faithful but wait let's see how jesus interprets the true meaning of the scriptures in, in the next verse he says, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in her own heart. We're going to stop there. But I wanted to at least read that. And then we'll pick up from there next week and <clears throat> see how far we get. Let me close. Defending marriage is the church's responsibility. Sin will continue on in the world, whether it's a, whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it's alcoholism, you know, whether it's murder. Uh, sin is sin, and the world's going to be in judgment of that one day before God. What we need to do is stand up and begin to preach the gospel to those that will listen. We can't be complacent anymore. The Lord's return can be happening very, very soon. Do you know how many people opposed same-sex marriage in this nation? 50 million people voted against it. 50 million. 50 million. The Jade Helms that's taking place July 15. Do you know how many they're suggesting they should get rid of? 
in this nation in order for this nation to continue on growing towards globalization? Do you know how many? 50 million. They want to eliminate 50 million people. What 50 million do they want to eliminate? Those that voted against same-sex marriage. Those that are conservative. Those that are against globalization. Those that are going to oppose you know, the laws of our new government. Actually, our new regime, <laughs> in a sense. So it's interesting. We're living in the last days, and we need to wake up, and we need to see, and we need to study. We need to read these articles. Yes, we have to work. Yes, we have to eat. I understand that, and we have to live our life down here. But we need to be prepared to defend ourselves. Virginia and I are speaking uh, to one another about defending ourselves, about purchasing a, a weapon so that if something happens, we can defend ourselves against anyone that would cause harm to her or to myself or to my family. We're thinking about how we can be a witness in those instances, you know, how we can somehow share with them the gospel before we have to defend ourselves, which is difficult. It's a dilemma I'm personally in. I'm struggling with it. Because if I go out, you know how I want to go out? I want to go out like Christ. I want to go out like Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I want to go out telling them that Jesus loves them as they're taking me out. I really do. That's what he's laying on my heart. I don't want to go out shooting at them, defending myself from them, and then saying, oh, another guy who's just a conservative nut and wackle. No, I want to go out like Christ went out crucifying the flesh and sacrificing my life for him because I want to go out like him because I want to be like him and the church needs to rise up and begin to ask these questions I'm not telling you what to do by the way whether you defend yourself or not uh, I'm telling you we need to be prepared we need to be ready and there are people that are falling away even in this church and it's sad to see uh, that we're giving in to the enemy and not standing up for our Christianity